Meister Eckhart was a 14th century Christian mystic, theologian and friar in the Dominican order. His teachings include an emphasis on detachment as the highest virtue and the meaning of the birth of the word in the soul. This talk will examine some of these concepts. The format for this talk will be to start with a short biographical introduction, which Elizabeth will give, followed by the spiritual teachings of Meister Eckhart, which I will present together with Elizabeth. Thank you, Neville. These short biographical details have been taken from a book by Linda Brown Holt called Meister Eckhart and the Bhagavad Gita. And I'm giving you this background so that you can understand the person that you're going to be hearing about tonight. Meister Eckhart was a 14th century theologian and friar in the Dominican order. In recent times, he's been referred to as a Christian mystic, although he didn't refer to himself as that. He lived from about 1260 to about 12, 1328, although the exact dates are unknown. Little is known about his early life or family, except that they were landowners. He entered the Dominican order at the age of about 15 in modern day Germany in a place called Erfurt and received orders by 1278, after which he went to study further in Paris. At the age of 33, he served as a lecturer at the University of Paris and nine years later in 1302, after completing more studies, he assumed the external Dominican chair of theology, placing him at the apex of academic success in medieval Europe. It was at this time that he became known as Meister, which was a customary title. By then, Eckhart was regarded as one of the most brilliant and charismatic theologians and preachers in Europe. He became responsible for 47 convents in his role as provincial, which is church leader, of the northern province of Saxonia and had many other duties which took him all over Europe. Note that he traveled around on foot in the course of carrying out this work. After another period as external Dominican chair of theology in Paris from 1311 to 1313, he was appointed vicar general in Strasbourg, which was known for its active Dominican monastic life. It was also a center for female theology and mysticism and for the Beguines who were communities of lay women dedicated to prayer, poverty and good works but who were not bound by monastic vows. The church disapproved of the Beguines because they encouraged independent thinking, as well as actions that could not always be controlled, some of them engaging in emotional and highly visionary forms of mysticism. It's possible that Eckhart's previous success in working with nuns may have made him seem to be an ideal emissary to prevent such outbreaks of religion, religious hysteria. What the authorities would not have known at that time is the extent to which their theologies mirrored his own convictions. Eckhart became known for his unorthodox way of expressing conventional church teachings. His work with the Beguines led to great enthusiasm for his teachings from them but diminished his status as a Dominican theologian in Europe. This led to his persecution and condemnation for heresy by those in the church who were in tune with a growing wave of inquisitional fervor in the 1320s. In 1323, he was called to Cologne by the archbishop there to answer claims of heresy. He was the first theologian to be tried for heresy in the Middle Ages. What the Archbishop and other of Eckhart's opponents in the church objected to was his radical teachings on the birth 
of the word in the song, without any mention of the church's intermediary role in this process. He was preaching that God and I are one, and he described to the unlearned masses a path to salvation that managed to avoid mention of the sacraments and church altogether. Although the Archbishop was closely linked to the Pope, when the Pope conducted an investigation into Eckhart in 1325 and 1326, Eckhart was cleared of unorthodoxy. The Archbishop, however, prepared his own case, which resulted in Eckhart appearing before the Diocesan Inquisitorial Commission. He was found not guilty of heresy, but was summoned to the papal court in Avignon, where he died, perhaps due to his advancing age and the fact that he had had to walk 250 miles to get there. He was condemned posthumously and only returned to public attention in 1857, over 500 years since his death, when German scholar Franz Pfeiffer issued an edition of his work. His works consist of about a hundred sermons in German, which were mostly delivered to and taken down by the Beguines to whom he preached. In addition, there are more academic works in Latin for the benefit of the Dominican orders. This talk will be centered on a sermon delivered on Christmas day and concerns the most important concept in Eckhart's teaching, namely the birth of the word in the soul. There have been several translations of the sermons in the last 150 years. This is not an easy accomplishment as they are written in medieval High German. One factor the translators have to consider is whether the manuscripts can be verified as being genuine works of Eckhart. Tonight, we will be using the much praised translation by Maurice O'Connell Walsh, published in 1979 many of whose translations are available as a free download, and we will be giving you the details of those later on. So that's the end of the biographical part, and now I'm handing back to Neville. Thank you. An overriding message uh, is the importance of finding stillness within. And so I would like to start with a period of stillness. Allow yourselves now to fall silent. Thank you. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. In this famous soliloquy from Shakespeare's Hamlet, we have a glorious description of human potential. But is this how we see ourselves? Eckhart sees us ultimately as nothing less than sons of God. In many traditions, a state of higher consciousness is referred to. In the Mandukya Upanishad, it is the fourth state of consciousness described as beyond empirical dealings, uninferable, indescribable, unthinkable, in which all phenomena cease. 
and this appears in the proem of the secret doctrine in the first fundamental proposition. A good question to ask is, have we ever experienced this higher state ourselves? Although it is not possible to describe this state, Plato refers us to having a memory of our source and that somewhere deep within we remember who we really are. In other words, we remember our own divinity. Eckhart expresses this state in a different way. He speaks of the birth of the word, which he says is deep in the ground of our being. And I'm sure that he is referring to this, this same state where we are fully united with God, in which is there is no difference and therefore no duality. There is no more me and God. Eckhart has been described as a mystic and in recent years has been embraced and adopted by many different traditions. But we must not forget that Eckhart is first and foremost a theologian and Dominican monk, and therefore he expresses his message using the language of the Catholic Church. We must therefore not become too concerned with the particular language he uses, which might be unfamiliar to us. To us as students of theosophy, his language might come across as unacceptable, owing perhaps to some long held ideas and beliefs about the church and what it has stood for over the centuries. Initially, we might also be philosophically opposed to it on account of the many injustices it has perpetrated. We might even object to the word God. Our idea of God, however, is likely to be far away from Eckhart's, and Eckhart's is likely to be very far from what the mainstream church was teaching at the time. Eckhart's message is far from mainstream and what he was saying had repercussions later in his life when it brought him into conflict with the authorities. They took exception to some of the statements he made, such as... God is neither good nor better nor best. When I call God good, I speak falsely as if I were to call white black. He may have had enemies within the church, but he was popular with the people and they traveled from far to hear him preach. I suspect that part of the problem with the authorities was because they thought that what he was saying was liable to be misinterpreted by the masses who who upon hearing such statements might as a result question the status quo as it was in the church. Before we look at this particular sermon, please note that a word that Eckhart often uses is creatures. And by this he means everything that is not God. This includes all things and all ideas. In fact, anything that is brought in from outside, which is why he often interchanges the word creatures with images. Our theme tonight is the birth of the word, which is the subject of the very first sermon in the Walsh edition. It was delivered on Christmas Day, and it begins with the following words. Here, in time, 
we are celebrating the eternal birth which God the Father bore and bears unceasingly in eternity, because this same birth is now born in time, in human nature. Saint Augustine says, what does it avail me that this birth is always happening if it does not happen in me? That it should happen in me is what matters. We shall therefore speak of this birth, of how it may take place in us and be consummated in the virtuous soul whenever God the Father speaks his eternal word in the perfect soul. Please note that the uh, quotation from St. Augustine has not been verified. Um, people have looked to see where he said this, but have been able to find it. And also, please note that from the very start, Eckhart uses the word time and eternal, which often appear in these sermons. Please also note that Eckhart says later that this is only for the good and perfected man who has walked and is still walking in the ways of God, not of the natural undisciplined man, for he is entirely remote from and totally ignorant of this birth. Please don't be disheartened by this, uh, because at first glance it would seem that most of us would not qualify uh, under this definition. Eckhart goes on to draw our attention to three relevant questions, namely, where this birth happens, which includes where the soul is receptive, whether one should do anything to precipitate this happening, and what are the benefits that accrue from this happening. These things are impossible to describe because they don't accord with the world we normally inhabit. And so they have to be described in terms of the world that we do know. There is no special place and there is no entering. There is no birth. And so we use the term as it were when speaking of these things. In answering this question, Eckhart often refers to the ground of being. He describes this as the purest thing that the soul is capable of, in the noblest part, the ground, indeed in the very essence of the soul, which is the soul's most secret part. There is the silent middle. For no creature ever entered there and no image, nor has the soul there either activity or understanding. Therefore, she is not aware there of any image, whether of herself or of any other creature. Into this ground, no creature has ever entered. Remember, a Creature is any created thing, thought, or idea. This ground is beyond understanding. There is no activity there, and it is completely silent, still, and empty. It is the noblest, purest part of our being. It is here where the word is spoken. This is not an event, because he states that this is 
continuously happening. And therefore it takes place in eternity and not in time. In this ground, the birth of the word takes place without mediation. It does not come from outside and therefore needs no channel through which to come. At this point in Sermon 1, Eckhart refers to the soul's powers, which have to be completely withdrawn. The word powers needs a little explanation. According to Eckhart, there are seven of these powers, and he says that they have to be completely withdrawn. The three higher powers are intellect, memory, and will. And the four lower powers are the lower intellect, anger, desire, and the senses. When I first read this, I was surprised to see anger as one of the powers. But then I read in an essay by Tim Addy, a Plato scholar, that in one of Plato's dialogues, the soul is likened to a winged chariot, which is guided by a charioteer called reason, and propelled by two horses called anger and desire, which symbolize the primary powers of the soul. Tim Addy then says, anger in this context, of course, should not be understood in common terms. It is not the negative emotion normally denoted by the word, but rather the harmonizing power which allows reason and desire to act as one in their hunt for the beautiful. Coming back to Eckhart, he is saying that the birth of the word takes place without mediation of any kind, even of the higher intellect or the will. All of these powers play no part. These powers are concerned with outside. They are in creation, in time. And this birth of the word takes place beyond time, in eternity. Our normal way of achieving anything is to develop our powers and through them, accumulate knowledge and anything else we want to possess. But what Eckhart is telling us here is that this knowledge is of a different order. It is not to be accumulated. And in fact, he says that we have to leave the powers outside. The true knowing of which he speaks does not come from the outside inwards, but comes from the inside, outwards. As no creature has ever entered the ground of being, it is empty and it is therefore at its most receptive. Into this emptiness, God must enter, as it were. Although, of course, this is only an expression as God was always there in eternity. Eckhart scholar and contemporary Dominican friar Richard Woods describes this birth more as a welling up from the fathomless abyss rather than entering. Elsewhere in his writings, Eckhart says that when one leaves behind all creatures, God is compelled to enter because he has no choice. He further makes the point that God enters the soul with his all, not a part. He gives of himself fully. You do not receive a little bit of God. This brings in another great Eckhartian teaching 
where he says that detachment is the highest of all the virtues. This may sound strange to us, as we probably would, if we thought about it, consider love, compassion and humility to be the highest virtues. This is not the view of Eckhart, who emphasises that detachment includes and is above all of the other virtues. In this connection, he finds that Only pure detachment surpasses all things for all other virtues have some regard to creatures, but detachment is free of all creatures. He recognises that many great masters have said that love is the greatest virtue, but Eckhart says, Love constrains me to love God, but detachment compels God to love me. God is more readily able to adapt himself to me and can more easily unite with me than I could with him. The discussion on detachment could be the subject for the, an entire talk in itself, but I'd just like to expand a little more here. Eckhart uses two words, Abgeschiedenheit and Gelassenheit, which have been translated as detachment and letting go, respectively. In another sermon, which is about turning out the moneylenders from the temple, he says that there is no bargaining with God. This is on account of the fact that everything that you think is yours was given to you by God, and therefore you have nothing to bargain with. However, we do not see it this way and believe that we possess talents, families, knowledge, etc. This needs to be seen in its correct perspective, namely that these are all God-given. Eckhart is asking us to remember that in our essence, there can be no possessions of any kind. Man is made in the image of God and God is detached. This is because God is in eternity, and in order to join with him, you must give up your attachments, which keep you firmly established in time. Eckhart goes as far as to say that God is not moved by prayer and was not moved even by the death of his son, which I suspect sounds to us as almost blasphemous. There is a story from the Indian, Indian tradition which explains the meaning of galasanheit, letting go. It concerns how to trap a monkey. It involves a glass container in which is placed an orange. The entrance of the container is only just large enough for the monkey to squeeze his hand through and grab the orange. However, it is not large enough for the monkey to extract his hand whilst holding the orange. All the monkey needs to do in order to be free is to let go of the orange, but he will not do so. He believes he is trapped. This is said to be similar to our condition. If only we could let go, we could be free. But somehow we cannot do it. Returning to the sermon, there follows a difficult passage where he explains how in order to know anything, you first create an image of that and take it inwards. But the soul was never outside and therefore no image can be made of the soul. Consequently, it cannot be known. And of this Eckhart says, And so she, the soul, knows all other things, but not herself. Of nothing does she know so little of as herself. 
for want of mediation. Eckhart is saying here that there are no senses or powers that can make an image of the soul so that it can be known. God needs no image and has no image. Without any means, likeness or image, God operates in the soul, right in the ground where no image ever got in, but only he himself with his own being. This no creature can do. And therefore there must be a silence and a stillness and the father must speak in that and give birth to his son and perform his works free from all images. The next question he answers is whether one can do anything to precipitate this birth of the word. What do you think Eckhart's answer will be? Take a moment to reflect on this. He assumes that you will be leading a good life and that you will be adhering to the teachings of Jesus Christ. And then he says, They must know that the very best and noblest attainment in this life is to be silent and let God work and speak within. When the powers have been completely withdrawn from all their works and images, then the word is spoken. A further illustration of the importance of this silence is referred to in the following quotation. The most powerful prayer, one well nigh omnipotent and the worthiest work of all, is the outcome of a quiet mind. The quieter the mind, the more powerful the worthier, the deeper, the more telling and more perfect the prayer is. To the quiet mind, all things are possible. Why would Eckhart think that silence is better than doing good works, for example? Austerities of various types were often practiced by religious orders. But Eckhart says that if you seek God in a particular way, you end up getting the way, but missing God. Later on, he says, The further you can get from creatures and their images, the nearer you are to this, that is, the birth of the word and the readier to receive it. If only you could suddenly be unaware of all things, then you would pass into the oblivion of your own body. Eckhart, quoting St. Paul, says of this state that Memory no longer functioned, nor understanding, nor the senses, nor the powers. He quotes Anselm of Canterbury, who said, Withdraw from the unrest of external activities, then flee away and hide from the turmoil of inward thoughts. What Eckhart is talking about cannot be known in the normal way. He describes it as a, an unknowing knowing, because it is beyond all our powers. He explains that we normally only know anything because we hold an image of it. God cannot coexist with images, creatures. Hence, our normal word mode of knowing does not work. It is only through stillness that you become closer to the ground of your being. He says, And Christ meant by his words, 
Whoever abandons anything for my sake shall be repaid a hundredfold, and whoever would possess me must deny himself and all things. This is another way of expressing the meaning of detachment or letting go. Further on, he says, Because it is so secret, this word came in the night and in darkness. St. John says, The light shone in darkness. It came unto its own, and as many as received it became in authority sons of God. To them was given power to become God's sons. Don't we think that this is a remarkable thing for Eckhart to quote, in which he suggests that far from Jesus being the only begotten son, we all have access to that same power. We are all sons of God. Another point he makes is that the seeking of knowledge in the normal way does not satisfy. One always wants more. There is no contentment. He says we are always clamoring to know things, but this is no thing. To quote verse 7 of the Mandukya Upanishad on what is known of the fourth state, but which isn't actually a state at all, but which is, it is beyond all states. They consider the fourth to be that which is not consciousness of the internal world, nor consciousness of the, sorry, no, nor conscious of the external world, nor conscious of both worlds, nor a mass of consciousness, nor unconsciousness, nor simple consciousness, which is unseen beyond empirical dealings, beyond the grasp of the organs of action, uninferable, unthinkable, indescribable, whose valid proof consists of the single belief in the self, in which all phenomena cease, and what is unchanging, auspicious, and non-dual. That is the self, and that is to be known. This type of knowledge cannot be acquired. Plato says something similar when he asks how we can purport to know anything when we do not know ourselves. Conversely, if we know ourselves, then we will know all things. This knowing will not be in quantity, but will be more akin to being. After hearing this, you may be wondering what the point is of doing any study at all, including attending this talk. In this connection, it might help to know that according to the Indian tradition, there are stages in attaining the understanding about which Eckhart speaks. The first of these is simply to hear about the truth in the same manner in which the Begin nuns heard the teaching of Meister Eckhart through his sermons. The next stage is having heard the teaching to reflect deeply which I believe is practiced regularly in religious orders. You could call this reflection or self-examination. Socrates said that the unexamined life is not worth living. A few years ago, I attended a class studying the Manduka Upanishad. I attended the class for about five years. The Mandukya is considered to be one of the finest and deepest Sanskrit texts. It consists of only 
12 succinct verses. Each week we recited a few of the verses and looked in great detail at the meaning of the words. We often only looked at three or four of the verses during the session. At the end of each one and a quarter hour sessions, we would spend the last 10 minutes in silent reflection. This was very powerful and profound. It was not until my last few months of these classes that I realized that the profundity of the silence was as a direct result of the close examination of the text. I say that this because it might sound as if Eckhart is saying that nothing you can do is helpful. But in as much as it can bring about that stillness and knowledge of the ground of your being, it is not only helpful, but essential. It does not have to be the study of a sacred text, it could quite as easily be gardening, cleaning or cooking, if it is performed as an act of service and with full awareness of who you really are. Eckhart says we need to make holy what we do. The important aspect is always to remember the ground of your being and the connection of yourself and all things to God. The final question that Eckhart answers is, what are the benefits that accrue from this happening? That is the birth of the word. He tells us that the fruits of the birth of the word um, well, in fact, he's quite brief on this subject. He says that uh, his answer is to emphasize the vast distinction between outer and inner knowledge. Remember that outer knowledge is knowing through images and inner knowledge is knowing through being. He makes the following point. All the truth learned by all the masters by their own intellect and understanding or ever to be learnt till doomsday. They never had the slightest inkling of this knowledge and this ground. Though it may be called a nescience, an unknowing, yet there is in it more than in all knowing and understanding without it. For this unknowing lures and attracts you from all understood things and from yourself as well. The supreme importance of understanding this con uh, concept is demonstrated by the following statement by Eckhart. And in very truth, I believe, nay, I am sure, that the man who is established in this cannot in any way ever be separated from God. The reason why one cannot be separated is because this happens in eternity and not in time. Is there any one of us who would not wish to be in a state where they can never be separated from God? Is this what is meant by life everlasting? This theme of the birth of the word recurs often in the sermons as does the main instruction to leave behind all creatures and images. This is achieved by stillness and silence, which takes one inward to the ground of one's being. By emptying yourself, you are preparing the ground and God then must enter. I would like to finish with a beautiful quotation from what are called Eckhart's 
counsels on discernment, which were given by Eckhart to young novices whilst conversing at evening meals. After this reading, I would like to have two or three minutes of silence where we look into ourselves and as far as possible, let the power of these words bring us to stillness and an appreciation of our own true natures. We will then have time for questions. People ought never to think too much about what they could do, but they ought to think about what they could be. If people and their way of life were only good, what they did might be a shining example. If you are just, then your works too are just. We ought not to think about building holiness on action. We ought to build it on a way of being. For it is not what we do that makes us holy, but we ought to make holy what we do. However holy works may be, however holy the works may be, they do not as works make us at all holy. But as we are holy and have being, to that extent, we make all our works holy, be it eating, sleeping, keeping vigil, or whatever it may be. It does not matter what men may do whose being is mean. Nothing will come of it. Take good heed. We ought to do everything we can to be good. It does not matter so much what we may do or what kinds of words ours may be. What matters is the ground on which the works are built. Let us have a short period of silence. Thank you. I'm going to end with, as I said at the beginning, the sources from which uh, you may like to, to go to look for further information. So there's the Linda Brown Holt book, book by Richard Woods, the another one by Edmund College and Bernard McGinn, and then the free download of all the Walsh German translations which includes sermons, the sermons and some of the treatises. And uh, if you can't find that translation, if you would email the, the Theosophical Society and they will pass the message on to me, I can send it to you. But if you Google Meister Eckhart Walsh translation, you can find it. And that's my email address. In fact, you could email me direct.